Can you all see the screen? Yes, we can. Good, wonderful. Well, I'm coming to you this morning with a burden on my heart. There's been a growing de-emphasis on the issue of Advent or the second coming of Christ. And I want to address some of the problems related to that this morning, that we can focus our interest and have a renewed interest that Jesus is really coming soon. Is it a delay that he hasn't come so far? Or is Jesus' plans and prophecies really on time? In a recent Adventist layman's publication, a writer said, we know Jesus will return someday, but it seems clear now that the expectations the church gave us about how soon it would happen were very misleading. She then went on to say the state of the world as the days of Noah is not present. Global societal and cultural improvements are actually being seen with decreasing global poverty declining child mortality, increasing life expectancy, increasing leisure time, increasing literacy rates, declining crime rates in the world, less world hunger, less child labor, less teen pregnancies. This was all published in the last couple of weeks. Then she implied that Christ's second coming is a long way off. Another recent author quoted the poet Ann Carson, we have lived past our myth. A totally opposite view came from an evangelical Christian news magazine out of Minnesota two weeks ago. Alarmed at the uncertainty of our time, the editor said that there has been a covert assault by the left, a war on both Christianity and America through the fantasy world of socialism. Sweeping the world, but riveted on America, she said that there is incitement that this nation is irredeemably racist, incitement of violence to revolutionary groups like Antifa, abandonment of safe, legal, and rare abortions as desired, encouraging innocent children to irreversibly ruin their lives by chemical and sometimes surgical transitioning to the opposite sex, using the COVID pandemic as cover for imposing unprecedented totalitarian control over people, disenfranchising the electoral system through fraud. That publication, Olive Tree Ministries, raises the awareness that an apocalyptic curse has come to this country. The brilliant and God-oriented editor of another publication, the whistleblower magazine, David Kukulin, used our current American crisis to appeal to its broad base of conservative Christian subscribers to be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights to the world, Philippians 2, 15. And then he said America has become a very broken nation. What America really needs is a revolution, but not a Marxist one. Indeed, no real lasting revival is possible for America without a genuine spiritual revival. Be blameless, be harmless, become a light shining in the world. Perhaps he's unaware that the Bible says at the end that this country will speak as a dragon, Revelation 13, 11. It does appear more and more demonic. The end is really not far off and I want to address that again here this morning. What has been missing? Why has there been such lukewarmness towards the advent that's part of our name? Are things in society really improving, which would imply a long delay? Are things in society disintegrating, even becoming demonic, suggesting we are nearing a final end time crisis? Let's look and 
adjust our thinking towards the timing awareness. The challenge of waiting is part of biblical history. Abraham and Sarah are examples. At the age of 75, Abraham headed with Sarah, his wife, to the promised land. She was 65. God said that through him a great nation would come, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. They were childless. God conveyed to the patriarch that all the land that you see, I will give to you and your, yes, here it is, offspring forever. They needed to have a child. They had been married 40 years. She was barren. When a woman couldn't bear children, it was deemed her fault in that culture. She therefore suggested that her Egyptian slave, Hagar, might become the bearer of that promised child. Ishmael came into their household. You know the sad story. Later, Abraham had to send Hagar and that son away forever. That is a hard story to understand. Abraham and Sarah waited. Then came the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then Abraham's deceit of King Abimelech in Egypt regarding his wife. They waited. Then at the age of 100 and Sarah being 90, she bore a son, Isaac. God's verbal promise to Abraham for a son was delayed 25 years. Even more than that, she was considered way past childbearing age. Abraham undoubtedly doubted at times, but during that uncertain wait, the Bible says Abraham believed the Lord, Genesis 15, 6. God has a clock. Sometimes he helps us to tell time. Sometimes we wait, but with his promises. Because of the seeming delay in Christ's coming, it is easy to doubt the promise that he will come again. John 14, 3. He promised to do so. We are to believe that promise, but when? Very soon now, as you will see. Abraham had direct promises from God himself to have hope in. We do have biblical prophecies to give us objective understandings. And brothers and sisters, they are direct from God also. They are exciting. They're detailed. Few really re understand them because they are not being studied today like they should be. Jesus said you will know when he is even at the doors. That's like somebody in the front door of your house knocking on the door, Matthew 24, 33. When the prophecies in Luke 21 begin, which are similar to Matthew 24, look up, your redemption draws near. From the Old Testament comes this advice. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, though it seem to wait, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. What is God telling Habakkuk in Habakkuk 2, 2, and 3? It will be right on time, God's time. There are incorrect views that many Adventists have regarding the second coming of Christ. I would like to just go over a few of these here this morning. There are those who believe that Jesus won't come until the character of God is perfectly reproduced in his people. Ellen White actually says that, but what did she really mean? We are not to serve God, she says, as if we are not human, but we are to serve him in the nature we have that has been redeemed by the Son of God through the righteousness of Christ. We shall stand before God, un God pardoned, and as though we had never sinned. Our High Calling, page 48. She went on, when he sees men lifting the burdens, trying to carry them in lowliness of mind, 
with distrust of self and with reliance upon him, he adds to their work, isn't this wonderful, his perfection and sufficiency. And it is accepted of the Father. We are accepted in the beloved. The sinner's defects are covered by the perfection and fullness of the Lord, our righteousness. Those who with sincere will, with contrite heart, are putting forth humble efforts to live up to the requirements of God are looked upon, what a promise, are looked upon by the Father with pitying, tender love. He regards such as, here it is, obedient children, and the righteousness of Christ is imputed to them. It may be one of the most misunderstood concepts of grace. We are saved by the perfection of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. Our characters can be perfectly produced, reproduced. Are you Christ hearing anything? Because oh, we okay. believe and have faith in his merits. In fact, Ellen White went on to say, the believing sinner is pronounced innocent while the guilt is placed upon Jesus Christ. The righteousness of Christ is placed on the debtor's account and against his name on the balance sheet is written, pardoned eternal life. I hope that's the case for each one of us here this morning. I love that, don't you? All this came into focus understanding to our church and to Ellen White after 1888. If we wait for a morally perfect group of people, we would never see Jesus. That has been called the last generation theology, and it's being addressed quite vigorously within our church. But why then hasn't Jesus come? Other issues must occur, and we've addressed that in past presentations. Number three, one of the challenges of many Christians has been the assumption that Jesus would come soon. Soon was perceived in the context of in our generation or our lifetime. An article recently came out in an Adventist magazine that we have, it is too late for Jesus to come soon. So perhaps we need once again to re-understand what soon or what quickly as the book of Revelation puts it really means. It means in the context of prophecy being fulfilled. The prophecies guide us to win. The unsealed portion of Daniel brings new light and now tells us it is very soon. Number four, there are some who think that society is improving as we note, but that denies what Paul said about the end. This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And I think we can all say that that is coming to us now. For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those who are good, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. These individuals do not study world events nor no prophecy, they will be caught unawares. Their delay and unknown wait, now we raise a caution. Peter warned, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. First, he's not giving us a list of sins, but of most importance, there will be people who promote their doubts about the second advent. Scoffers know of God's prophecies. They make them therefore capable of mocking those who believe in the end of time. Peter sees that as a deliberate sin because it shows contempt for God's word and end time signs. These will arise preceding the second coming. We're seeing that today. And that gave me the burden to make this presentation this morning. 
they also have pleasure in their natural desires. The apostle says, the scoffers continue, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things can continue as they were from the beginning of creation, 2 Peter 3, verse 4. Those are the scoffers' doubts. They deny the time they are in. They deny any possible fulfillment of prophecy. Because generations have come and gone, the gospel of end things or last things is irrelevant to them. This they willingly, Peter said, are ignorant of. Peter even went so far as to say that they have forgotten or purposely denied the story of how God dealt with the antediluvian world. Their thinking is dangerous, even fatal. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That's a characteristic of God and not necessarily how we interpret prophecy. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Here's the counsel. View any weight as God's mercy for you to prepare. The Lord's promises of his coming will be on time. Important orientation. Peter went on. The day of the Lord, the second coming, will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. His coming will be like a thief, but now I raise a caution. To whom is it like a thief? Those outside of the ark, they and Noah were given a timing message. One small group took it seriously. One large group did not. We have a timing message, but a misuse of E.G. White's writings has totally altered the perceptions of many Adventists. There are biblical messages after 1844 and in her writings. An Advent, urgent Adventist warning, Paul addressed this thief issue to the Thessalonians in his first letter. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The thief finds people who are unprepared. The implication is for unbelievers or those who are not sensitive to the information God has really provided. We know that by verse 4 and 5. In these two verses, every Adventist needs to know. But you, brothers and sisters, we're all brothers and sisters here this morning. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness. Oh, we, we should be in a different situation so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. First Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5. Believers are prepared. They know the prophecies. They are watching. They are spiritually awake. They understand the signs and the times. Do you expect are you are your reasons any different than 10 years ago 20 years or 30 years ago or do you expect jesus to be on time and know objectively why it's all in the bible do you know what it means to be those children of light is your understanding deep enough that he won't come as a surprise children of the light what light? Let's look at E.G. White for some light. Based on the Masoretic text, which our King James NIV 
and that Bibles are based upon. Bibles rely on, we know that the plan of salvation will end at the sixth millennium from, not creation, from the fall of Adam and Eve. This can be determined through two main studies within the Bible. Through many genealogies and reigns of kings, we are very close. Through the 2300 year prophecy in Daniel 8, 14, we are very close. This is denied by many, though clear in the Bible. The scriptures give us a 6,000 year earthly history since the fall of Adam and Eve. Alan G. White identified with this six millennial understanding. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, Satan's temptations to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. A noise shall come even another quote to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, Jeremiah 25, 31. And then she said, for 6,000 years, the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and his heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Now all have made their decisions in the 6,000 year period. The wicked have fully united with Satan in his warfare against God. The time has come for God to vindicate the authority of his downtrodden laws. Another thought Satan's work of ruin is forever ended. For 6,000 years he has wrought his will filling the earth with woe and causing grief throughout the universe. The whole creation has groaned and travailed together in pain. Now God's creatures are forever delivered from his presence and temptations. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They, the righteous, break forth into singing, Isaiah 14, 7. And then she goes on to talk about the shouts of praise that, of triumph that actually comes from the courts of heaven. What happens at the seventh millennium? That will be our first period of time we spend with Jesus in heaven, a sacred seven. That is a Revelation 20 discourse. We, brothers and sisters, are very, very close to this time. The wait time now will be very short. Another timing element comes from Revelation 17. Babylon comes to its end in Revelation 16, 19, under the seventh vile plague. And then a plague angel comes in Revelation 17 to John and says that he will tell the story of how that happened. It will occur when a harlot, an apostate church, is sitting on or ruling over the people of the world, still pending. A harlot is riding on a beast, a nation or country, and we now know that is Vatican City State, which started in 1929. Number three, a harlot is sitting on the seven heads of the beast, assuming popes from that 1929 on. The seventh ended in 2013, Revelation 17:11. Then there is an eighth referring back to the beast that comes onto the scene that the kings of the world give authority and power to. That is the Holy See, already in place at the United Nations, waiting since 2013. The wait time will now be very short. Another clue that we are getting close relates to the war and calamities that Jesus talked about. He said, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth pains. These became statistically significant and I've presented this to you sometime in the past in the 1978 to the 1983 window. 
Jesus said regarding all these signs recorded in Luke 21, when these things end, no. When these things are underway, no. When these things begin, begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. The wait time will now be very short. There is really no delay. We are going through a final period of the many prophecies in the Bible that really are pristine clear. We are told in Hebrews 10, cast not away your confidence. He's coming, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, in God's timing, and that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. There won't be a delay. Another very interesting clue that we are getting very close. Daniel was given a series of prophecies housed in chapters 8 through 12. The collective message called the Kazon or Hahazon. That's the Hahazon is with a quote, the quote is with Strong's Concordance vision, were to be sealed until the time of the end. But, the, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will then be increased. That knowledge relates to prophecy in Daniel. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end, Daniel 12, 4 and 9. These were opened up in the 1970 to 1980 window. Most of Daniel 8 through 12 is now clear. There is before us a period of time called an appointed time of three and a half years. It will be the little time of trouble as Adventists understand it. It will begin with the enforcement of the Sunday laws. Mrs. White knew this and talked of this specific time period of three and a half years in 1902 in 19MR, page 282. We do not have a delay. We have no reason to be scoffers. We need to be children of the daytime seeing the light and sensing urgency to be ready. Ellen White says the Lord is calling upon us to come into line. The day is far spent, the night is at hand. The judgments of God are already seen, both on land and on sea. Incidentally, statistics show that 2020 were the most expensive natural disaster year in recorded history. No second probation will be granted us. This is no time for making false moves. Let everyone thank God that we still have an opportunity to form characters for the future eternal life. Amen? There has been limited understanding of many of these prophecies until the last couple decades. Jesus' coming is getting close. Lessons from the apostolic conundrum. Four times Jesus predicted that he was going to be arrested and put to death. Each time Jesus makes these predictions, the disciples in some way or another manifest their lack of comprehension. It was actually a denial of truth. Jesus then used the occasion to teach them new things. Ellen White says the disciples of Christ could not believe that Christ should be treated with such contempt, that men should scourge him and put him to death. They expected that he would be setting up a temporal kingdom, that he would sit upon David's throne and reign as a temporal prince in Jerusalem, bringing all nations into subjection to his will. Although Christ plainly told them what would be his fate, they were not prepared to change their ideas they were unwilling to believe the disagreeable truths that he opened up to them, were unwilling to give up the thought that Christ would be a conqueror. They would not harbor the idea that he would be rejected and treated as a slave by his enemies, 
not believing the words of Christ, they did not comprehend the words of the prophets and thought them out of harmony with the words of Christ. We marvel that they could not comprehend these things, for as we stand this side of the cross, we see clearly how the predictions of prophets were fulfilled to the letter. Because they did not believe the words that Christ spoke to them, and he always spoke truth and never deceived them, they were unprepared for the trying scenes through which they were called to pass. What a lesson for us today. We have an urgent need to receive the wisdom that the Holy Spirit can bring when we ask and study prophecy. They also believed that Christ would return in their day. That was forgivable from the standpoint that some of the end time prophecies they needed to know were parts of Daniel 8 through 12, which were sealed until recently. That brings us to important points to our understanding. Since we now know the meaning of the sealed, the hahazon portion, that's the Hebrew words for that vision of Daniel 8 through 12, we now have abundant knowledge to see the immediate future. Since Ellen White saw this as a paramount importance, she said that portion of Daniel would become, can you believe this? That unsealed portion of Daniel would become part of the three angels' messages. We have no excuse for saying there is a delay. We have no excuse for saying we have no ob objective evidence that he is coming soon. This is what she said. Daniel shall stand in his lot at the end of the days. His message will be understood. John sees the little book unsealed. That's Revelation 10. Then Daniel's prophecies have their proper place. Here it is in the first, second, and third angels' messages to be given to the world. We talk about those three angels' messages and the world's need is to hear. But Ellen White says that Daniel's unsealed prophecies needs to be combined with those messages the unsealing of the little book was the relation, message in relationship to, yes, this is what she's saying, and she's totally correct, in relationship to time. The sealed portions of the prophecies are now open. We are not only to understand them, but to present them to the world with the three angels' messages. Those prophecies are loaded with timing messages that help us to understand the book of Revelation. A dangerous expectation. I've discussed this a little bit in the past. I just want to bring it up once more because we see this coming up all the time among Adventist publications over the Sunday issue. Ever since Pope Sylvester I, at the time of Constantine, a worship on Sunday issue has been alive. Every Sabbath, he said, on account of the burial of Jesus, is to be regarded as execration or loathing of the Jews. In fact, it is not proper to observe because of Jewish customs. Sunday is to be observed joyfully by the Christians on account of the resurrection. The Sunday issue isn't new in the Catholic Church. Reports even today aren't new in the Catholic Church. It goes way back till Sylvester I. Pope John Paul II had an interest in Sunday, and it began to accelerate it with him in 1985, when a revision of the Roman Catechism was published by this Pope. The civil authorities, government should be urged, he said, in the Catechism to cooperate with the church in maintaining and strengthening this public worship of God, referring to Sunday, and to support with their own authority the regulations set down by the church pastors. Well, that's what Ellen White said would happen. For it is only in this that the faithful will understand why it is Sunday and not the Sabbath day 
that we now keep holy. He even went further in this apostolic letter, Deus Domini. He wrote, in this matter, my predecessor, Pope Leo XIII, in this encyclical, in the encyclical Rerum Novarum, that was in 1891, incidentally, spoke of Sunday rest as a right, worker's right, which the state, there it is again, must guarantee, going way back into the 1800s. Therefore, also in this particular circumstance of our own time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation, you see the church and the state ties in, and this is exactly what Ellen White said would be part of the principle of the end time Sunday laws. It's part of the DNA of the Catholic Church. Benedict came into papal power and he said many interesting and strange things to justify Sunday. Saturday is no longer the worship day of God. Only on Sunday can we become part of the body of Christ in the world. Only by worshiping on Sunday can we avoid egotistical isolation. In other words, small groups on Saturday. And instead be united to a great community, a universal community, becoming related to everyone in the world. Uh, everyone worships on Sunday, almost. The Old Testament account of creation has structured the framework of a week leading up to the Sabbath, in which he finds completion. Thus, the Sabbath was an expression of the covenant between God and man at creation. The covenant communion between God and man is built at the deepest level of creation. Now, look what he says. The Sabbath is the seventh day of this week. After six days, the Sabbath is the day of rest. But something quite unprecedented happened in the nascent church. This is all man-made, and imagine what he's now saying. The place of the Sabbath, the seventh day, was taken by the first day. The structure of the week is overturned. By whom? By pagan worship and by mankind. Mithraism came in the early part of the church era, right after Christ went back to heaven. Mithraism worshiped on Sunday, the Sunday. No longer does it point towards the seventh day as the time to participate in God's rest. It's a pagan adoption. This change is utterly extraordinary. Yes, it's giving up what God asked considering that the Sabbath, the seventh day, seen as the day of encounter with God is so profoundly rooted in the Old Testament. The first day, according to Genesis account, is the day in which creation begins, but it's not the Sabbath. Now it was the day of creation in a new way. See how he's justifying Sunday. It had become the day of the new creation. God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was good. Then Pope Francis came into power, stating the Sabbath actually is supposed to matter. The whole day, not just Mass, for the Catechism teaches in a certain paragraph on Sundays and on other holy days of obligation, the faithful are to refrain from engaging in work or activities that hinder the worship owed to God, the joy and proper on the Lord's day. Moving on to the next slide. So we see that the Sunday issue, having centuries of history, the things that will act as a catalyst to bring them in have not yet occurred, but they are in place. That's what our focus should be. And I think we've made that as one of our presentations. The Sunday laws will come in it's part of the plan, the agenda of the Catholic Church in Rome. But to bring them in, it requires certain steps. And that is the issue that we need to be focusing on as Seventh-day Adventist. This is our, where our focus should be today. Is there a delay? No, everything is on time. Everything is falling into place. The question, are you ready for Jesus to come? 
Are you ready to explain the Bible in defense of the Sabbath? Are you ready to explain end time prophecies? Are you ready to live with angels? Are you ready to live with Jesus? Are you ready to marry the prophecies of Daniel 8 through 12 with the three angels' messages? The Lord is coming. Time is short. Get ready, get ready, get ready. For Christ's sake, call a halt to things of this world that are hindering that preparation. You have not a moment to lose. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. I want to worship a God like that, don't you? You probably all are aware of this poem, this saying that comes from the 1800s. For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the knight was lost. For want of a knight, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. So a kingdom was lost, all for want of a horse shoe nail. The nail that lost the kingdom was for us today, preparation and its related knowledge. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are in serious and awesome times. Things are really pointing objectively that this world can't last much longer. And we're going to be seeing that wonderful face of Jesus, our Savior, our friend. Father, we want to see his face. We want to be rejoicing when we see his face. And I pray for this little group that has been gathered here this morning, that their passion will be to study more, to learn what it means to be eternal friends with Jesus Christ. Go with us now as we continue the rest of this Sabbath day. We thank you that we could be together here in the precious name of Jesus, our friend 